Dr. Jay Kumar TK, uh, who is the additional director and I mean, sorry, um, HOD of cardiovascular and thoracic surgery, Government Medical College, Kotayam, and Dr. Saji De, additional director and associate professor of radiation, oncology, RCC Trivandrum, to please occupy the seats for sharing. I think uh, afternoon, everybody with a full stomach, I think, uh, with, without going in for sleep, we will start our discussions and our presentations, I think. So, uh, we have Dr. Venkata Lakshmi Narasimha, who is an additional professor of psychiatry in Nimhans, Bangalore. And uh, he is a researcher also with so many publications and a lot of awards to his credit. I don't want to enumerate all of them. Like, so, he will be talking uh, on yoga in substance use disorders, something very important for our society right now. If you look at uh, even in the schools, like, there are so many instances where, say, even one of the teachers in Bangalore school told me that the substance use uh, prevalence is like something like 80 percent in his school. So this is a very important topic for us. So Dr. Venkata Lakshmi Narasimha, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the warm uh, introduction. And uh, so. What I will do is, uh, I will take forward from the place where Sir has left. So, Sir has pointed out that uh, in his presentation, Sir has told tobacco and alcohol being the risk factors. So, I work at an institute where, which has the largest uh, addiction psychiatry world, ward in India. So, we have around 80 beds, out of which uh, 20 beds are specifically for women with substance use disorder. So, this is at Nimhans, Bangalore, and this is called a Center for Addiction Medicine. So, only in Nimans, Bangalore, we have, only in Nimans, we have a separate ward for women with substance use disorder. So, in a uh, typical day, what kind of uh, cases that do I see? So, as sir has told that I am both a clinician and also a researcher. So, on a typical day, for example, this is, these are the cases that I have seen on uh, the day before I traveled here. So, the first case that I saw was a 55-year-old female. So she has been using alcohol for almost 30 years. But she has been taking around one peg of alcohol in the night. But she started having family problems. And in the last two years, she has been taking around uh, 18 units, which means that which approximates about one full bottle of alcohol. 24 units is the full bottle. She has been using around 18 units of alcohol per day. And the second case that I was seeing that day was a person, 23-year-old person, who has been injecting heroin. So he has been using for last four or five years. And he's also diagnosed positive for HCV. And 17-year-old boy who has been brought by his mother, who is using cannabis. And uh, he tells cannabis is something that is uh, legal in the West. And why don't you people go and talk to the government and uh, ask government to legalize cannabis in India? And uh, the mother is worried that I have found pouches of cannabis uh, in his uh, books, in his bag. So what to do? And a 20-year-old college student who absolutely didn't had any friends was also had brought us autistic phenotype, which is not autism, which is not completely normal also. And the reason why mother has brought him was he was using gadgets excessively. So he doesn't have friends and he has been using gadgets for almost uh, 10 hours in a day and not going for any, uh, his, he, he has actually quit his education in the middle of his graduation. So these are the profile of patients that I see. So again, like uh, the neurosurgeon who spoke that we come with some disclaimers. So the disclaimer that I would like to give is that I am not an expert in yoga. I am a primarily a clinician and researcher, but I have been associated with research integrating yoga to substance use disorders at least from last uh, six years, from 2017. And the contents of the presentation are my personal views and do not reflect the views of the institute that I represent. So what are my objectives of today's presentation? So I have two objectives. First of all, I wanted to tell many people what they know about addiction is not completely correct. So I would like to give a brief overview of what is addiction. Then I will also bring in the yoga related research in addictive disorders. And if you wanted to do yoga related research, what kind of integration or what kind of methodology that you need to plan. 
Okay, so this is not the definition that I have given, but this is the most widely accepted evidence-based definition. That addiction is a treatable chronic medical disease, like diabetes, hypertension. It is a brain disorder that is treatable and it is also chronic. Why chronic? People think that, hello, this fellow has decided that he will stop alcohol and then again he goes back. If I have to give an analogy with diabetes, this person has decided that I'll stop sh uh, eating uh, laddus, but went back eating laddus. So addiction is something that is chronic, relapsing, remitting kind of an illness. And people who develop addiction do not develop uh, like they wanted to become addicted to substances. That's why they went on uh, because they are a bad person. That's why they went on becoming dependent on substances. It's not that. Again, all these things are evidence-based, research-based, research-backed. So it. People who develop addiction develop because of complex interaction among the brain circuits. So there are a lot of changes that happen in the brain circuits once a person starts using the substance. And it is also genetically driven. And environment plays a very important role in how people become uh, addicted to some substances. And someone was asking trauma. Individual life, life experiences plays an important role. Once this addiction process sets in, people become Compulsive. Although they start using the substances for pleasure, once they start substances for pleasure and once the neurobiologically the addiction state sets in your brain, then it becomes more compulsive that people end up taking again and again. And they continue to use despite having harmful consequences. And like Sir was telling that prevention and treatment, both approaches help in people with addiction similar to diseases like hypertension and diabetes. So, morning, sir was telling the uh, neurosurgeon, sir was telling about the happy circuit. So, the nucleus accumbens, ventral tegmental area to nucleus accumbens, this is called as happy circuit. So, a 16 year old boy that we are talking about, about the cannabis. So, he first went on to experiment the drug because he wanted to feel high. So, what happens once he feels the high, which comes with uh, 50 rupees of uh, cannabis? So, the person again wanted to get the same high again. So over a period of time, what happens is cannabis hijacks the circuit. So every time the, uh, the circuit keeps telling that I wanted a high. Because if you wanted to get high by the end of marathon running, you have to run 43 kilometers, you have to train for uh, uh, almost six months, you need to sustain the motivation. But to get high on cannabis, it's just 50 rupees and it's on the market. And with 50 rupees, it stimulates the same way that it is going to, it is going to stimulate when you run a marathon. So the amount of dopamine that gets released is 10x compared to the amount of dopamine that gets released when you have good sex. So that's the amount of uh, dopamine that gets released when people use substances. So the first stage is the binge or intoxication. So first time the person experimented, there is a binge or intoxication of the on the substances. Then after a person starts using for a couple of days or weeks, then he starts having something called as withdrawal. So the day he doesn't use the substance, then he starts having some withdrawal symptoms. Someone was telling about alcohol. So the next day morning, he starts having tremors. He starts having tachycardia. He starts having headache. So then he goes back and takes the substance again. Then what happens? Over a period of time, neurobiologically, the changes sets in. This is where the role of yoga also comes, comes into the picture. So there is something called as changes in the prefrontal cortex that happens where the executive functioning, prefrontal cortex is a area which actually uh, is the executive, is the executive control of your uh, brain. There is another center called as anterior cingulate cortex, which is called as a gear. So this gear tells the execution part to actually tell the person whether you need to use the substance or not. So substances go and affect this part of the brain and then the person goes on taking again and again. So this is where the salience sets in, where the person forgets what he has to do at home, whether he has to take his son to the school, whether he has to earn money, go and work. So all these things doesn't become important. The most important part that becomes is using substance. So this part of the brain is something that uh, is very important in terms of the yoga, yoga-based research that I'll be talking about. So every person, sir, the 16 year old boy mother has brought, he has used two times of two times cannabis. Do you call him addict? So addict is a stigmatizing term. You don't use anymore these days, but still among lay public, addict is a stigmatizing term. 
Addict is a term that is commonly used, but in medical literature, addict is something that you should not be using. So do you call him addict? No. So to call someone having addiction, see, these are some symptoms that you see. So there is craving, repeated urge to use substance, tolerance, one peg of alcohol is not sufficient to give me high. So I increase it to two pegs. Two pegs is not sufficient to give me high. I increase it to six pegs. So when I started, one peg is giving me high, but at the end of two weeks, six pegs give me the same high. So this is tolerance. There is a lot of con loss of control. I think that I will use only one peg of alcohol and come back in the party, but I end up drinking two pegs, three pegs, full bottle. There is use despite harm. I have been diagnosed with liver disease, but still I continue to drink alcohol. There is withdrawal symptoms that I told. There is salience, the importance. Out of these six criteria, if three are there, then you call the person is addicted to substances. Again, this is based on the neurobiology that I have spoke about. So how do you classify drugs? Addictive disorders, there are substance use disorders like alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, heroin. There are also behavioral addictions which are recognized. That is gambling disorder and internet gaming disorder. So why do people get addicted to drugs? Is it something to do with drugs? Is it something to do with the person? Is it something to do with family? Is it something to do with society or the government? So if you ask each individual, each individual has different reasons. So it is not one reason. So it, the answer is, it's a combination. It is a biopsychosocial model of addiction that we commonly think about. Again, the vulnerability. What makes people go into these substances? There are multiple factors. One, someone was asking me when I was sitting there, ADHD. People who are impulsive, when they are as a child, so why they are impulsive? Because of the dopamine deficiency in their prefrontal cortex. So to get the dopamine, to, get the, uh, to correct those dopamine deficiencies, they are naughty at class when they are four. But to correct those dopamine deficiency at the age of 16, they are the people who go and use the drugs. So it is a vulnerability that has to be treated first rather than treating the drugs. If the child has been adequately treated for ADHD when he was a child, then the problem of addiction would not have set in. There is family history. People who have family history of addiction has a high risk. Adolescents are particularly vulnerable. Environmental factors play a very important role. People who have comorbid depression, bipolar, these are the people who are at risk. So someone was talking about the epigenetic changes. So there is a large study on 10,000 children who, progressed in, who are currently progressing into adolescents. What is their vulnerability? This study is called a C-Veda. You can go back and see about the C-Veda project, which is looking at brain scans at uh, 6 years, 8 years, 10 years, 12 years, 14 years. What we found is vulnerability is something that is very important that contributes to the epigenetic changes like trauma, childhood trauma or childhood uh, sexual abuse also leads to these epigenetic changes, which again results in addictions and also other mental health related problems. Because I'm talking about addiction here, I'm focusing on addiction. This is also true for various physical health conditions. Uh, again, the trauma there might be slightly different. Okay, so in general, how do we handle alcohol dependence? I'm again, I'm giving here as an example of alcohol dependence that we treat the withdrawal symptoms. But more than that, the problem is, how do we prevent the relapse? Where does, how does yoga fit into preventing the relapse? So we have a lot of medicines uh, in terms of uh, preventing the relapses for alcohol use disorders. There are multiple medicines that are available in the market. Some are FDA approved, some are not FDA approved. But despite all these medicines, the, uh, with adequate evidence-based treatment, we are able to prevent 60% of the people from going back to substance again. But what about this 40%? Whether these 60% can also be helped uh, their quality of life can be helped with yoga is something that we have been studying. So these are some of the evidence-based uh, psychological interventions that are available for treatment of substance use disorders. One is the motivational interviewing and you might have heard about CBT, cognitive behavior therapy. There are group therapies and there is also mindfulness that has been studied. But yoga is something that has been studied at least for last 10 years. So this is the uh, Nimans has Nimans Integrated Center for Yoga, which has been there from 2014, and currently it has been converted as Department of Integrative Medicine in 2019. And this integrative medicine also includes yoga and also Ayurveda and uh, modern medicine. So this Department of Integrated Medicine uh, has brought out 
this textbook, not textbook, a book on science and art of yoga in mental and neurological healthcare. In this, we have reviewed the evidence of yoga in substance use disorder. I was one of the co-authors for this book. So, in my review, what we have found, again, this is a this is not a systematic review. This review we have looked into what is the evidence that is available for yoga in substance use disorder. What we found is yoga can, can, can be considered as a viable option in treating substance use disorder as an add-on. So remember the term add-on. So it is not, the evidence is not available as a first line treatment, but as an add-on. And more specifically, it improves the quality of life from in people suffering from substance use disorders. So there is evidence that is available for people who are injecting heroines. So as an add-on to buprenorphine, buprenorphine is a standard treatment of care. As an add-on to buprenorphine, yoga has been found to be helpful. There is some evidence to tell people with alcohol use disorders. So here, we have not just studied the scales, that is the quality of life, but we are also looked into some biomarkers, whether this yoga will help to improve certain biomarkers. The previous speakers were talking about biomarkers like BDNF. So we looked into this BDNF, we looked into the ACTH. So what we found is that yoga is found to be helpful as an add-on for alcohol use disorders. Again, for tobacco cessation also, yoga has been found to be helpful. These studies are not from our center, but these are from elsewhere. Again, this is one important study you should go back and look into. The study which looked, at to, looked into Om chanting versus us. So, people have randomized groups into Om chanting and people have, the other group was doing just us. And this was an fMRI based study, which means the person is into the scanner and the functional connectivity is being looked into. What they found is, there are certain areas of the brain that gets activated during this OM chanting, but there are certain areas of the brain that gets deactivated during this OM chanting. So what are those areas? Like Sir was telling in the morning that amygdala, amygdala is your emotional circuit, where it tells, come on, go this, do this, do that, which means that it's an emotional component of your brain. There is prefrontal cortex, which is a breaking component of your brain, which tells, boss, don't do this. What yoga does is, that Om chanting in this study, which we thought that it will be helpful as a mechanism for how yoga helps in substance use disorders, is that this activation of prefrontal cortex telling that, boss, don't do this, is, powerful, is, is strengthened because of doing yoga, whereas the deactivation of amygdala, which is, it tells, boss, don't do, uh, the deactivation of amygdala, amygdala which tells, chalo, go and do this. So that deactivation is something that prevents person from going and doing these substances. So that's where the role of yoga. Here, specifically, what was studied was Om chanting. Again, these are some of the clinical insights that are given in the book in terms of when you are planning for yoga for people with substance use disorders, what kind of precautions that you need to take prior to the session. And there are certain indications what you need to do within the sessions. For example, people when they are in withdrawal, they may not be able to do Kapal Bharti. So, so those kind of things has been studied and those, has, those kind of things has been reported in our research that these are the things that you, need, you should not be doing when you are doing yoga for substance use disorder. So it is becoming more individualized, disorder specific rather than blanket do yoga, no do this, do that, do, don't do this, generate evidence for what to do, what not to do. So again, for the sake of time, what I will do is, I will go on to the next slides. So when we are talking about the evidence, I have done yoga, yoga is found to be beneficial, I am an immense doctor. No, that is not evidence. I have done yoga on my patient who has come with this problem and uh, she has improved. That is also not considered as evidence, that is considered as very low level of evidence which means that background information, expert opinions, these are low level of uh, evidence. Manjuna sir was telling, then what is the highest level of evidence? Highest level of evidence is randomized control trials. Next highest level of evidence is systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Again, these systematic reviews and meta-analysis becomes highest level of evidence if there are well-conducted randomized control trial. Sir was showing a meta-analysis out of which there are multiple studies which are of poor quality. 
So when there is a garbage in, which means that poor quality studies are studied in meta-analysis, the evidence is also garbage out, poor quality of evidence will come. So RCTs are at the highest level of evidence, beyond that is the systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So we need to generate evidence which is of RCT, randomized control trial. So for example, one of the studies that we have, uh, sorry. So one of the studies that we have designed is for yoga for uh, opioid use disorders. So in that study, what we have done is, we have two arms. One is yoga arm, the other arm is treatment as usual arm. So you need to have adequate power to conduct the study. The previous speaker was telling about the randomized control trial. And you need to tell what kind of study population you are going to use. And there is a component of randomization, which means that people go into two separate groups uh, with allocation concealment, with blinding, and you need to validate the study. The validation of yoga process, you are talking about the system of validation of yoga. So that validation needs to happen, like Manjunath sir was telling that the validated protocols needs to be used when you wanted to study. Then you need to assess and you also need to have blinding, how you are going to assess, how you are going to blind. Those are very important things when you are planning a study. So in summary, as I again insist on the fact, addiction is a chronic medical disease and there is treatment available. Yoga has a possible role, of, role in treatment of addictive disorders. We need to generate quality evidence for yoga in addictive disorders. So with this note, I would like to end. Thank you. Thank you. Now it is my great privilege to invite the second speaker. And uh, as you know, to be a doctor is great, whether an MBBS or MD, it is very great. And to have maybe some 75 purpose, papers international, or maybe five international patents, or four national patents, that is something which is more great. And to be the director of our regional cancer center, you know what a great achievement it is. And that is Dr. Rega Nair, the person who is going to present the next paper. Now, I was asked to make the introduction in just two sentences. The first sentence is okay. Now, the second sentence is that uh, uh, I am the addition director of the institution and I had been associated with Madam and uh, have been seeing changes in the past uh, five years about uh, 700 crores rupees infrastructure development. The, but the most important thing that is happening in our campus is the welfare. We have robotic surgery and all, but what we <coughs> lack is that human hand which we are trying to develop. We have the power within us. We have that immunity within us. Once it was radiotherapy, chemotherapy and all. Now it is what is within us that we are bringing out to fight all these uh, diseases. And that is yoga which can improve our immunity to bring down this calamity of cancer. And that is a particular topic, madam. We can present cancer and yoga. Thank you, Dr. Sajid, for that introduction. And thank you, Yoga Research Foundation, for inviting me for this talk. So uh, the topic for today is exploring benefits of yoga among cancer patients and survivors. I'm doing a literature review and also giving some future recommendation in this field. So regarding yoga and its significance have been discussed in many talks uh, yesterday and also today. So I'm not going to repeat anything except the fact that uh, the WHO recommendation recommends yoga to achieve 50% reduction in physical inactivity. So one of the targets of <coughs> SDG. So there are several SDG goals put out by the WHO, Government of India and all states also, also follow this. Sustainable Development Goals, they are called SDGs. So WHO recommends 15% reduction in physical inactivity. So our CM, uh, Chief Minister yesterday in his speech said that uh, we are uh, going to have 100% physical activity in the whole of uh, population, whether it's population born to homes, elderly, or whether it's a younger population. So I think we will achieve something 
with uh, that government policy that's going to already started implementing that now uh, signs of yoga in controlling ncds ncds are non communicable disease of which many talks have covered diabetes hypertension all these are lifestyle diseases in kerala something uh, to, uh, like what we see in the west we are ha having the scourge of the ncds the non communicable diseases diseases are overtaking the communicable diseases so uh, just summing up the effect of yoga on immune system which i understand all have already been covered chronic stress in a person it has been proved that that leads to chronic inflammation in the body as well as and oxidative stress this a background of long years of chronic inflammation gives rise to diseases chronic stress gives rise to this low grade inflammation low grade inflammation persisting in the body with addition to other factors give rise to the ncds like diabetes hypertension a weakened immune system and also cancer and studies uh, according to a harvard health blog from 2020 says that uh, studies show that yoga could slow the harmful physical effects of stress and inflammation now effect of yoga on cancer patients and survivors uh, i think i am best positioned and uh, in the correct position to give this talk i am just not presenting what is present in the literature that will be giving a uh, mostly it will be ra uh, a review of the randomized control trials that has happened in cancer survivors during treatment and after in survivors after treatment uh, i am also a long term uh, yoga practitioner i have been practicing raja yoga in its full form for the last 16 18 years under the tutelage of a yoga guru in addition i am also do uh, have also gave, uh, gotten the um, kriya yoga from msr for the last 13 years the only time i uh, there is a break in both my the kriya yoga and the raja yoga i am practicing was when i was undergoing chemo and radiation a few years back so that put a break in my practice so i am back on on the uh, rails with both these which i have resumed in full form so i am correctly positioned to talk about this with a low grade of low grade of evidence but with review of literature so most of the studies described in the literature in index journals have been uh, the focus was more on on supportive care we are not supposed to intervene in the standard treatment guidelines that we follow world over for cancer treatment no dilution on that yes, because i said that yesterday also we don't interfere in that but patients need supportive care so in the supportive care during treatment as well as post treatment phase they need supportive care and that is what the studies all the studies have been focusing on to provide the patients undergoing tre uh, treatment as well as post treatment long term survivors so long term intervention using yoga uh, can reduce inflammatory cytokines and oxidative stress among breast cancer patients because they are the largest number of patients you see they can be sleek taken into the study when compared to other uh, head and neck cancers or where they have they have more morbidity so i think breast cancer most patients are uh, in the studies have been breast cancer patients because of the commonality as well as the ease to get into the study and these inflammatory cytokines and oxidative stress can be monitored by the the parameters that we can measure from the blood so among the uh, pro inflammatory cytokines in breast cancer patients have been monitored are tumor necrosis factor and interferon gamma a significant reduction in inflammatory cytokines uh, among patients receiving radiation and chemotherapy or combined or uh, singularly leading to an improved quality of life so what we are looking at is the quality of life here uh in breast cancer the quality of life uh, studies research findings are the focus of studies have been all, almost always on the outcome indicators you should have some indicators 
when you do some interventions, there should be some indicators to go by. So the, indi uh, the indicators of uh, quality of life are during and after uh, cancer treatment are overall well-being. You score that, sleep quality, fatigue reduction, managing obesity or overweight. These are some of the indicators, outcome indicators of assess to assess the quality of life. Now coming to the highlights of various studies, uh, yoga as a supportive care for cancer patients, as I said, during and after treatment have definitely shown to improve physical, functional and emotional well-being that has been there in most of the studies. Next is yoga is useful to reduce cancer related fatigue and symptoms of depression, Ex especially during treatment and post treatment. You need all the support that you can to give the patient in addition to that for the patient to have uh, symptoms of depression are quite natural. To come out of that and to come out of the fatigue, you need something else. So supportive care is very, very useful, comes very useful in these patients. So definitely yoga is supposed, not supposed, as proven to reduce this fatigue as well as symptoms of depression. And a meta-analysis of 17 studies that included 2,000 plus patients reported a significant effect on cancer-related fatigue, fatigue in post-treatment breast cancer patients and the effect increased with the duration of yoga pro program. That means the longer the, dura, uh, the duration of the yoga pro program, the better the patient's improvement of cancer-related fatigues and other symptoms. Uh, now, uh, there, was been, there has been studies on chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathic pain. That is a very important aspect of chemo many chemotherapy drugs. So these are findings from a RCT study. Uh, that came published in 2022 uh, in the Journal of Cancer Survivorship. So they studied cancer survivors. It's, uh, the study was done at Dana Farber Cancer Institute USA. And not only breast cancer patients, but the majority was, uh, were breast cancer patients. We had, they had gastrointestinal and gynecological onco um, oncology patients from their centers in the institute. Most, mostly they were stage 3 and 4 cancer survivors. They put this patient on eight-week yoga intervention program and they found out that there is a significant reduction in fatigue and de depression. But improvement in reducing pain but not a significant change was observed con uh, compared to the control group. That means pain has not decreased much, significant, no significant reduction in pain after chemo. But there is subjective or there is some improvement. And the limitation of this study was uh, the less sample size. So it's always better to have more, more number of patients included in a study. Now this is a 2019 published paper in Cancer, one of the most prestigious and very sought after journals. In 2019, there, uh, this paper, uh, Yoga for Symptom Management in Oncology, a review of evidence-based and future directions for research. Uh, this uh, paper reviewed 29 randomized controlled trials, 13, 13 of them uh, during the treatment, 12 studies after treatment and 4 studies in, uh, including both phases during and after treatment. And the findings was none of the trials documented any serious adverse effects. That's very important to note. Next is RCTs conducted during and after treatment have consistently reported improvement in quality of life, different indicators, fatigue, sleep, psychological outcomes and biomarkers like in other studies. But the uh, limitation was that most of the studies were done in breast cancer patients. So it limits the possibility of its effectiveness among other cancer patients. So this study limits itself to the breast cancer patients. Now, outcome measures used by these RCTs before and after treatment were varied. So comparison, making comparisons very difficult. Again, uniformity of yoga components, what type of yoga you are in, what specific type of movements you are using, whether types of pranayama, types of asanas, what exactly you are, that should be uniform across the patients, in, in including the, the, both the control and the study group. So, what are the challenges in incorporating this yoga therapy, uh, especially in a setting of cancer center? There are apprehensions among the oncology community that we have to address, even though I know about the, because I am a yoga practitioner, I know about the advantages 
and disadvantages, what movements to do and what not to do during chemo and after chemo. But we have to take the oncology community as a whole where only a minuscule of doctors know about yoga and less, less still practice yoga. So it is a sort of, in general opinion, it's sort of some form of body contortion. contortion and they may, that might expose the patient to musculoskeletal injuries. But th this is a serious concern. But this can be addressed only if the treating clinicians become aware of what they are going to do. There should be a dialogue between the treating clinicians. They should be aware and whoever is the yoga uh, person who is going to come and teach, that there should be a, a bridge between these two, dialogue between these two to ensure that the patient is not exposed to difficult asanas like your headstand, sarvangasana. All these you are not supposed to do. Only very, very less strenuous stretching exercises can be incorporated. Like what uh, one of the papers, um, I think it was a video of the dermatology uh, doctor that was, they, they were specifically mentioning about some asanas like the frog movement and all those. They, those are very gentle movements that can easily be incorporated along with pranayama. Pranayama in any form, usual, the usual forms of pranayama will not produce any bad effects in the patients. It only be beneficial because you are pumping more oxygen into the system. So pranayamas, yes, but regarding asanas, there has to be a consensus between the treating doctor and the uh, uh, providers, yoga, whoever is providing the yoga therapy and the patients as to what you can do and what you cannot do. Do you have the time? Yes, I'm running it. And so, um, existing scientific evidence of yoga on well-being needs to be discussed with the medical community because they are not aware of the yoga. Most of them are not aware of uh, the benefits, benefits of yoga. For example, because I was doing yo yoga, uh, Raj Yoga for so long, my pulse rate came from 70, 82 like below 60, it was around 50, but then again after my treatment regimen, it now it's again back to 70s. But I think I think for me it will take years for my heart pulse rate to go back again to less than 60. Uh, the Ministry of Aish could bridge a gap by medical groups, uh, by training, engaging medical groups and trained Aish doctors in discussing strategies for cancer patients. That is exactly what we need. We also need funding for that. Self-learning is the key for understanding the system for which the oncologist should all also be invited for the yoga sessions. Concluding uh, my paper talk, the studies have shown that yoga has the potential to improve cancer-related symptoms. And majority of the studies reviewed had small sample size, which necessitates studies with larger samples and proper research definition. Integration of yoga in the pluralistic health system has to be considered given the evidence that's current, that currently we have. A future recommendations include, we need more studies with a focus of, on different cancer types other than breast cancer. We have to, the need to identify priority and trust areas where interventions could be useful, whether it's going to be useful during treatment and post-treatment. As I said before, during treatment, can have mild asanas and pranayamas, nothing more than that. But post-treatment, you can slowly introduce all the asanas. Uh, third, selection of outcome indicators and proper evaluation should be uniform. Meticulous study design, selection of control groups, very important. This has already been dealt with in the, by the previous speakers in today's program. Then standardizing self-report assessments, that's also important. So we need to develop a yoga protocol for studies Addressing the heterogeneity of yoga interventions, that is very, very important. That to know which variant type, key components, movement, whether we are doing asanas, um, pranayama or dhyana. Dose, dhyana, there's no issue with the doing uh, pranayama along with dhyana. Dose and delivery mode of the therapy, yoga therapy is also very essential. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, madam, for that excellent uh, lecture and enlightening us on the various aspects of cancer and yoga, especially in the background of your personal experience. Now, may I ask both speakers to come to the stage?
So we will, due to the paucity of time, we may not be able to allow longer time. So just two or three questions. Anything, anything from the audience? Any questions from the audience, please? My question is to Dr. Narasimha. You've talked about the effects of OM chanting on the brain function. So there is just actually two ways of chanting OM, either loudly or silently at mind. So you have any data on the effects of OM chanting when it's done silently at mind level? Uh, so in this study, what they have, sorry. In this study, what they have looked into the OM, OM chanting, not in the mind, but outside. If it is in the mind, then we have to do RCT based on that, right? Can I add one, one uh, point to that? If you chant OM in the mind, how you are going to get the vibrations? The sound produces vibrations. So definitely there will be changes, but it will be more effective if you chant the OM. Again, when we talk about the validation, like Madam also highlighted, that people are trying on this OM chanting in specific way that for 5 seconds you have to do O and for this many seconds you have to, 10 seconds you have to do M. So that's how the protocol for this study, if you go back and read about this study, the validation has done in a specific way that people do, all the people who participate in the study do it in a specific way. So when we talk about generating evidence, we have to generate evidence with a specified protocols so that if someone else does the same study, they will be able to replicate the study findings. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Sunil Rajan. Um, mine is to uh, address to Dr. Dr. Narasimha, uh, Venkat Lakshmi. Uh, the question, I, first it's an observation and a comment actually. Uh, because addiction has long been treated as a disease, and it's a it's a stigma, as you as you mentioned, within our our own community of doctors as well as uh, the community at large. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Dr. Gabor Mate's work, and probably Dr. Van Bessel Van Hick about the trauma, the body keeps the score, and and Dr. Gabor Mate has had amazing work in uh, addiction medicine in Canada. Uh, where he says that you know um, addiction is not the problem, uh, actually it is a solution to a problem, um, which is mostly based on uh, trauma, predominantly childhood trauma, whether it's emotional and physical and sexual. Um, so in your study groups, uh, have you actually gone into some questionnaire based to address these aspects, whether there has been any background trauma, and if so, how you have been addressing them? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, this is an important point that you have highlighted that addiction is something that is considered as an epiphenomenon of underlying vulnerability. So it is more of vulnerability that leads on to the addiction. Yes, addiction is also a neurobiological state that develops once the drug comes into the picture. But if you don't address the vulnerability, how the vulnerability manifests as addiction, the treatment outcomes are not better. So in our studies, the C Veda, it's open. It's one of the largest cohorts of uh, 10,000 uh, children who has been following up. We have been following for last uh, six, seven years, and we will be continuing to follow up till they become old. So what we are trying to look at into is, we are also looking into, see, it is not just one factor that leads to a particular disease, like, for example, cardiovascular disease or the neurological diseases. It's a multitude of factors. It is a multiple factors. One of the factors is trauma. Yes, we are looking into the trauma using different validated scales. For example, for child, child sexual abuse, there are certain validated scales which are developed in Indian population only. So child sexual abuse is looked into. We have even looked into environmental factors. For example, lead. So in some of the studies that we found that lead is something that leads to the vulnerability of the brain changes, that is the externalizing disorders. We talk about ADHD and other disorders. So some of these factors also play an important role. Also genes, epigenetics, all these things are being studied in this study. Ma'am, thank you so much. I got a suggestion to make along with the patient 
the person who is attending the patient has to go undergo yoga because I've gone through it. That's exactly what I was telling yesterday in my, uh, in my in, uh, inauguration uh, talk. We'll be addressing both patients and the immediate caregivers yes. and including whoever is staff from our center who wants to learn. So everyone will be encompassed. We'll be <laughs> given the opportunity. It is, it's a free this thing whether you, can, whether you want to join or not. We'll certainly be including the immediate caregivers. Thank you, sir. I think uh, we are running short of time. It's time to wind up. And one more. Yeah, please. You talked about uh, addiction, but you know, I'm just wondering, are there any studies on you know uh, social media addiction and YouTube addiction, especially among the college population in the country today? Because that looks like an alarming problem, and you know, some statistics on this would be extremely helpful. Yeah. So again, uh, when it comes to social media, there are prevalence studies. How much is the prevalence of social media? But social media is not considered as a addictive disorder. But social media use can lead to harms, which is, uh, which leads to a lot of issues. But social media addiction is not considered as an addiction in, as a disease, medical disease. But there is research that is going on to look at what is the prevalence of social media use, what is the prevalence of social media problematic use. So the, those kind of studies are going on. And in terms of behavioral addictions, so behavioral addictions, a lot of studies are there on internet gaming disorders. So in internet gaming disorders, mindfulness, again the component that has been taken from the Eastern philosophy and also from the yoga philosophy, is that the mindfulness has been found to be effective in terms of reducing the behavioral addiction part. So this is in terms of the behavioral addictions. So I uh, think uh, we will wind up, I think we will continue the discussions in the… Yeah. Just one minute please, otherwise no, I am sorry. Yeah. Social disorders. So, any study on the radiation from the gadgets? Yeah, there are ongoing studies. There are also published studies. These studies becomes more prominent if the findings are replicated time and again. But there are ongoing studies which are looking at the electromagnetic radiation and changes in the brain. But these findings are not. We are not able to specifically tell that these are the problems that are happening or these are the changes that are happening in the brain. If you go back and look, like since yesterday, many people have spoke about uh, PubMed, which is the search engine for, like Google for medical professionals. If you search about this radiation and brain changes, there are various brain changes that are noted, but there are no specific brain changes that these are the brain changes that are happening because of, for example, a finding that has been studied in this study is not replicable in the other study. So that's the current state of research. Maybe we'll find answers more better after five years or 10 years because there is ongoing research on that. So can I have one question? As a, as yeah, thank you. As a radiation oncologist, do you have any comment to make, Dr. Sajid? Yeah, anything which can bring about a change in a physical matter should bring about a change in all other aspects too. Uh, we don't know what is happening, but we have yet to learn what is happening in other aspects. So we'll conclude the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we now move on to the next session and it's my pleasure to invite our chairperson, Dr. Bijulal, who is formerly professor of cardiology at the Sri Chitra Thirunal uh, Medical uh, Institute and, uh, and Technology. And he's currently the senior consultant uh, radiologist at Kim's Hospital in Trivandrum. So each of the speakers in this session have 15 minutes, that's allotted to them, and then a QA of 10 minutes. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Good evening to all um, respected uh, delegates and faculties. Uh, uh, I'm actually a cardiologist. I'm not the right person to chair this session on cancer, but still I have got uh, uh, enough experience with the yoga and uh, have authored a few, one paper on yoga also. I have done some research on yoga. So let's uh, hear from our cancer specialist, uh, uh, Dr. Janathul Firdaus. She's the first speaker. She's uh, an Ayurvedic oncologist with uh, lots of years of experience in this field. Let's hear from her. 
uh, you know, essentially cancer is a, uh, is, a, is a state where the cells lose their uh, ability to work in uh, cohesive. Rather, they become aggressive, they invade to others' uh, privacy and uh, start infiltrating and uh, like that. And this uh, currently the uh, treatment modalities keep on changing from chemotherapy to immunotherapy. Right now, immunotherapy is in a big uh, way where the, our own system tries to, uh, we make our own system to kill these cancer cells and how much yoga and Ayurveda can uh, uh, achieve help in this, uh, how much let us hear from Dr. Firdaus. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Namaskaram, dear all. And I uh, like to extend my pranamam to Guruji also, even if, uh, even his uh, physical presence, pranamam Guruji. Uh, my time is very short, only 15 minutes anyway, I'll try my best to do before that. Okay, uh, my subject is impact of yoga and Ayurveda in cancer management. Uh, okay, uh, here it is uh, global, uh, uh, I mean cancer is a global burden, uh, still it is ongoing the same way. It is the, in 2020, but even uh, 2023 also same thing is going on. Uh, standard, it shows that standard treatments do not work uh, for majority of cancer patients due to these reasons. I think you can see all this. I am not going to explain much due to the uh, time. So here cancer treated in our hospital. These are the, uh, this is the graph. In this you can see brain tumors are Main, um, most of the cases I have treated uh, are main brain tumors because immediately after my ausurgency, um, I got two cases of very critical uh, brain tumors. The, those were one is medulloblastoma and other one is uh, astrocytoma. Uh, both were boys of uh, one is of nine year and other one was at six years. And I have treated and not explaining everything now. Uh, but uh, both of them are living now. They came to me, they brought to me uh, with, uh, in a coma stage. There I have used Ayurveda and uh, yoga. Uh, to say the, about yoga, here I uh, mention one thing. Uh, here all the, I mean uh, already the effect of yoga and its significance are, are well explained by our eminent scholars. Uh, that is for the patients. But in this case, they were uh, children and they were in coma. So how can we use yoga in that stage? So uh, what was my strategy, strategy in that was, I learned yoga and I go through uh, yoga philosophy and uh, yoga physiology. Uh, as per this Ayurveda and yoga, uh, there are physiologically the cells are something different. Uh, maybe you, some of you may be knowing that is un, uh, many types of uh, cells are the, uh, there. Uh, Annamaya kosha, pranamaya kosha, jnanamaya kosha, and last is anandamaya kosha. So we have to consider here, we are going to treat, my, that was my strategy in that case. Uh, I'm going to treat not only for the annamaya kosha, but I, reached, I should reach them to Ananda Mayakosha. There, the doctor should be, or the health provider should be uh, the yogi. We, in, uh, you know, in this such, a, uh, such scenario, we could not teach yoga in a coma patient. So that is to tell about, and these are the cases I'm not going to explain much about. So uh, as I told the strategy, uh, there are uh, um, complementary alternative palliative and curative aspects are there. Of course, curative uh, in the sense, uh, if uh, most of the patient come to me, uh, in, in always it is like that in Ayurveda, they come as a last resort. So uh, even now, now it has come like uh, even for stage, but uh, most of the cases will be like that. So my strategy, I'll uh, approach all these uh, categories. Uh, alternative to therapy, those who have some any comorbidities to treat uh, due to some other reasons, so they can uh, select only Ayurveda. Complementary, I prefer more because with modern science, modern uh, treatment and uh, like a chemotherapy, uh, before chemotherapy, after chemotherapy, 
or during the chemo, before and after radiation therapy and chemotherapy, uh, like that. And here, what, what yoga can do is, I have given in, that is in audio yogi, you might have seen that. Uh, audio yogi, that is the concept of yoga. Uh, what I have um, adapted from yo uh, yoga philosophy, that is uh, its uh, immediate meaning. When uh, this peripheral meaning is, the yogi it means uh, the patient should be uh, rich. And then, uh, we, while we, uh, during our studies, it is ridiculous to think that uh, how can we treat only rich patients. That means actually, Adya Rogi means Sadguna Sambanna. That means the patient should have some qualities. That is, uh, uh, and according to this yoga. There, for other, uh, for patients, I teach uh, uh, yoga, means yoga, not asanas, yoga philosophy for them. Then first we have to make them Adya. Then if we go for treatment, the treatment will be much better and it is easier to treat such patients in all the way. Uh, so next. And the tools I have used is evidence-based Ayurveda, yoga, traditional medicines and marma therapy. I am from a traditional family, that's why I mentioned traditional medicine. Marma therapy is also a different uh, aspect and evidence-based Ayurveda, what I have practiced and all we Ayurvedic practitioners are practicing on the same way. Here the yoga is useful in the man lifestyle management, breathing techniques and practice of silence. You may be all knowing that is because practice of silence in the sense meditation, whatever, uh, what way the patient can do that, uh, that we prefer. And breathing is most important thing because uh, like a human body, each and every cell has a uh, uh, our potential to be, a, be another human. So breathing is important to not only human being for a person, but e for each cell. That, that um, some techniques are there, uh, deep sense of yoga, that is uh, teach to, used to teach uh, in that techniques. And the other points, I mean, it's well explained by other speakers. And uh, in, uh, about the etiology, in Ayurveda, the main emph emphasis is, uh, in, when I say Ayurveda means, uh, in Ayurvedic philosophy, both Nyaya, Vaisheshika are, philosophy are adopted and also yoga philosophy also ac accepted. That's why this go through together uh, in the sense of etiology. Uh, as per Ayurveda, everything has three types of etiology, etiology physical, mental and spiritual. Uh, in uh, phys physical, all are explained like uh, metabolic, genetic and environmental reasons, all I have already explained here. And Mendel is Pratnyabharada. Pratnyabharada means uh, the uh, intellectual blasphemy. And that means the um, uh, unnatural behavior, we can explain in that sense also, or it is against the wisdom, or against the nature of the body and mind. That is called um, Pratnyabharada. Uh, it is called like, uh, uh, the Dhridi Atma Vijnanam, three aspects are there. Uh, these are the medicine for, okay. These are the medicine for uh, mental disorders. Mental, uh, mental means uh, when patient uh, affected with cancer, uh, there, there will be some reasons. In my practice, I usually ask them uh, whether, uh, you, do you have any previous experience of any trauma, mental trauma or anything like that. In most of the patient experience, must have experienced some sort of traumas in their life, means not in, in, in their life, within uh, the past three, two years. Like it is uh, very important to um, assess the mental aspects. So that it may be a type of hatredness to somebody or deep stress or some relationship issues that can be uh, maintained by the steps of yoga. And we can advise what is mentioned in yoga philosophy in that sense. In the, the spiritual reason means, um, in Ayurveda, one sloga is there in Charaka, Purva Janma Kridam Pabam Vyadi Rupena Jayade. That means uh, the reason for the disease is the um, uh, Papa or uh, disarranged nature of.
previous janma. Here we can consider this previous janma of any cells because the cells and their uh, uh, the uh, most simple uh, this uh, definition of uh, cancer is uh, abnormal growth of immature cells. That means this cells has done some papa as uh, to be uh, some like that. And these cells are dif being different, taking different forms and being the cancerous cells. And the other sense, uh, spiritual aspect, we can take it as idiopathic reasons. In that sense also, it can be taken. The, um, uh, another thing, the psychosomatic aspect and, and social plane of cancer. That is, uh, in my clinic, I find it is most important thing because almost all patients uh, uh, diagnosed by cancer are accompanied by a fear factor. Fear is the most important issue when they diagnosed with uh, cancer because it has many aspects. It is more than, bigger than the cancer because uh, whenever they diagnose cancer, the first thought come to their uh, mind is life-threatening it is. Uh, and the another thing, thing is treatment. Uh, people think that treatment itself is a tragedy. And because um, chemotherapy, radiation, uh, and all other therapies, uh, surgery, everything is a tragic aspect is there. And another one is economic burden. The, uh, that, uh, like uh, the cost of medicine, cost of surgery, um, uh, even um, immunotherapy is best treatment, but its medicines are very costly, and such aspects are there. And so social stigma is another aspect. Uh, there we need a collective uh, approach uh, of uh, all the system, modern system, Ayurveda, yoga, and all. Because uh, whenever a patient affected with cancer, they don't know where to go and how to treat. They may know because somebody has gone to modern treatment, it ends up in death. Or somebody has gone to Ayurveda, or somebody has gone to uh, some cocks, and uh, uh, like that. But uh, everything might have ended up in, a, uh, in death or in a tragedy. So we ha there, there is a need of proper advice and uh, guidance for them. These all um, makes the uh, biggest factor, like uh, as a fear factor. And this fear is very important to aggression of the disease because irrespective of the stage of stage during diagnosis of the cancer, immediately after they came to know that they have been affected by cancer, I have seen, I have witnessed for that, the uh, symptoms aggravates more than before. And that is due to this factor. To address this fear factor, uh, yoga is the best one. None other therapies can do uh, on this regard. Because uh, when I say yoga uh, here in fear factor, it is um, not only the um, uh, yoga philosophy and physiology, but also uh, it's uh, yoga asanas and mudras also helpful. I give such advice to patients and I find uh, very in interesting results in such cases. Once they have uh, free from their fear, uh, we can see the, uh, the effectiveness of treatment so fast. The, um, this I am not explaining much ro role of yoga. Uh, that is uh, the pain, pain, specific and uncontrolled pain. In both yoga has some effect. It's not like uh, when we give any painkillers, killer medicine like uh, morphine, but uh, in some in non-specific pain in the sense they could not say where it is, but I am having pain. Such patients are there. In, so that is mental origin. Uh, because this, this is due to fear. This fear is in the mind. As per, uh, according to Ayurveda, mind is, uh, is a dravya. That means um, mind is a matter. Uh, one of uh, the nine matters, mind also included, and that I could not, uh, no time to explain. And as I'll explain, fatigue, depressed mood, all these things are uh, well um, cured by uh, this one, uh, yoga. And methodology of yoga, um, 
implementation. Here, uh, for every patient, personalized yoga protocol is needed. That is very important. Because in individual comfort zone should see, and their spiritual and religious evaluation also important. Because in, in my patients, I have seen many are very reluctant to uh, yoga due to many reasons. They may think it is unscientific in a way and the religious constraints also is there. So I give some yoga um, therapies and advice as per the yoga philosophy, like uh, deeper philosophy, that the body is uh, mortal and uh, the something is there inside the body is immortal and such sense we can give. But uh, that can be given, uh, means uh, unawarely or awarely. We can give because in some cases, I, if they are already well versed in yoga, it is easier. And otherwise, we can wrap it in in, a, in another way and should give. And this leads to uh, reduction of uh, fear factor and uh, emphasize he speedy recovery. Okay. Then this is one concept of Ajara Rasayana. This, is, this should be the effect of uh, uh, yoga philosophy when we teach them. They will be truthful, free from anger. Uh, social context is also important to develop them. They, this, uh, uh, when patient isolation is uh, very important and they should be uh, socially contact with, uh, uh, social contact should be improved in them. And self-discipline, regular sleep and alertness, these are the benefits of yoga if practiced properly in Ayurveda. Uh, so here, before and after treatment, two, um, uh, two reports I have mentioned, uh, shown here. One is CA-125 is one, 199.7 and in another one it is 19.82. It is treated in my OP. It's a 80 year old lady. Uh, in, in that patient I had given breathing exercise for this patient and it has got very good result. And the other one is uh, same like uh, it is a micro adenoma of brain. See the difference? There are difference you can see. And uh, the another one, this is, uh, sorry, uh, this is before. Uh, this is recently, uh, very recent case. In this, you can notice it is by 15 days, this changes seen. 4.5 into 3 into 4.4 centimeter, both breasts were affected. And uh, some, uh, millim in the, this cannot be calculated as much like uh, 12 mm. Uh, in the this one lymph node, the uh, but uh, lesion is reduced much. It is only in 15 days where I had given Ayurveda medic medicine plus I had made them. Um, that person was very uh, difficult to handle, and I had given the make them make him make her adya. That I think the result is due to this. In this case, pain also reduced with this treatment. We see the difference only in 15 days. Not even 15, I think 14. And uh, these are these are the cases I just kept here because uh, 100 cases I have recorded like this for this um, for this uh, colloquium. But no time to show all. These are the results I have, these are the data and that only I have see, uh, show here to tell that I have collected all the da data and there are, you can see there, cure rate 5 plus, 3 plus, 2 plus, that is a criteria uh, to assess that, just mention as per. And these are the cured cases and uh, I consider 10 years survival, not 5 years. This is the method, this is assessed in the same way. These are some data. So uh, the outcome of my treatment is complete cure 42% cases. And that is not only with Ayurveda, but integrated approach. Ayurveda, modern, and um, uh, yoga. I, uh, no homeo medicines, I, I don't know about uh, that. I don't much know about that. It does not. Uh, combined in this and symptoms reduced and changes seen in 29 percent symptoms reduced no change in investigation reports are 20 percent and 80 percent cardinal symptoms only reduced one percent slight improvement because the those cases almost all are uh, last stages 
and this is the um, quality of life improvement 32 percent excellent result in the sense um, and they 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 came back to their normal life that is 32 percent 20 percentage good 15 percentage improved 28 percentage stable in the sense they can get along well that is not cured not uh, not seen in the investigation reports also but they are better and this is the outcome of uh, uh, yoga uh, therapy uh, incorporated with the uh, Ayurveda and uh, I also emphasize two things uh, one is we doctors as uh, or health providers has to learn yoga and this yogic philosophy in deeper sense and uh, and then also we could uh, do this customized form and to give the patients and uh, another thing is uh, the collaboration of uh, modern Ayurveda and other systems together is needed. We, our aim is to cure the patient uh, and more than that nothing is there. And uh, by um, learning this yoga philosophy and its deeper sense uh, adhyatmika, due to this adhyatma vijnana, we will have that sense of some intuition. That is important. I, uh, in many times, I feel that uh, the main thing worked in my work is uh, the, this type of intuition. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe cannot uh, uh, explain by scientific society, but it is there. And uh, these are the outcome, mm -hmm. the symptomatic relief, the, all these things. I, I am not taking much time. Thank you. <laughs> I think. I think I have completed. Oh, sorry. I think I have completed in 15 minutes, isn't it? No, I just taken. Sorry, just taken again. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor, for those for sharing your uh, experience in uh, cancer, Ayurvedic cancer therapy, and also your sharing your approach to cancer therapy. It. Uh, most likely it is making a, it's a contributory role in yeah. management, a comprehensive management of patients, maybe some primary effect also improving the mental state they, they and the general the state of the, general physical state of the patient. Now let us go to a related topic which is much more common, but not uh, that malignant, but still uh, affecting lots of patients, lots of these young females. It's a polycystic ovarian syndrome, which could definitely, uh, it's a, um, as a primary problem is lies in ovarian dysfunction with the more of androgen, less of uh, less of uh, female hormones and insulin resistance, and there is definitely a factor from the, I mean, mental factor. So let us hear from uh, Dr. Rachel Nikita Sharma, who is a PhD scholar in University of Lucknow, on this topic. Over to you, Doc. Namaskaram to everyone. They say that the natural forces are the most potent forms of healers for any disease. So did the father of modern medicine, Hippocrates. He said, and I quote, nature cures, not the physician. Well, this is true for anybody who is facing with or suffering with any chronic disorder that has no cure. Because for them, it is only the natural forces which are the last options left because what they are battling with is something that is said to have no cure. Now the question is, who are these people? You know, there is a section of society, they are a section of people who have completely lost their motivation to life. This is due to the hyped standards of perfection that is trusted to them by you and me, or should I collectively say, the society. Before moving on, I would like to share with you a very profound uh, statement said by an actor named as Matt Damon. Uh, he said something very profound. He said that you cannot solve the problem of poverty without solving problems of water and sanitation. It's a short quote, but it's very profound. And so I made one of my own that says that you cannot truly empower a woman without helping her solve her health problems. And here, by the word help, I do not mean by merely providing health care infrastructure or any facilities. I mean to empower a woman to help her achieve health holistically. 
You know, as I speak now, one out of five women are being diagnosed with something known as PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a medical condition that happens to women where they have almost, you know, irregularities of uh, menstruation or almost no menstruation sometimes during their reproductive years. As a female who has battled PCOS myself, I will share with you first-hand information about my transformative journey of how I cured myself of PCOS through yoga, lifestyle modification, as well as conventional medicine. Now, I would not want to go into uh, the basic biology of how the, the body operates or how the ovaries function because there is a lot of paucity of time. But in short, I would like to tell you what is PCOS. Now, a human body, a female body, basically has female hormones, but it also has small quantities of male hormones. If a lady is diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome, then the ovaries secrete large amounts of male hormones or androgens into the bloodstream. This is what causes the symptoms of PCOS. Now, the symptoms of PCOS is what I say, it would be the worst nightmare of any woman. Any woman who would have PCOS would have the worst nightmare because the symptoms are absolutely harsh. Now, as I told you that I myself had PCOS, I had PCOS for 14 years of my life, and I'll tell you what is the first symptoms that developed. I had uh, contracted PCOS um, at a very young age of my life, and the first symptom that I saw is that the vision keeps on depleting, the eyesight keeps on weakening, and the second most important thing, as we know, that there is irregularity in menstruation, and sometimes there are females who do not even menstruate during their reproductive years. There is gain of weight, especially around the belly area, and this is due to slow metabolism. The third symptom of PCOS amongst females is that you would see females who would have a lot of facial hair, which is known as technically hirsutism. Sometimes these ladies would also have a lot of acne on their face, which looks very bad. Sometimes it would be on both the parts of their face, sometimes the acne would be on one side of the face, indicating that particular ovary to be affected. Apart from this, the other symptoms of PCOS are mood swings, male pattern of hair baldness, as well as obesity and infertility, which is the most biggest risk of the 21st century. Now, as I said that not everybody knows what is this uh, PCOS, how is it caused? The cause for PCOS is absolutely not known. Some people speculate that PCOS can be either genetic. Secondly, and most importantly, it is said that PCOS is caused amongst women who lead a faulty lifestyle or who have bad eating habits. Obviously, this is not created in one day or a few months, but it takes a lot of months and sometimes even a few years. The third most important cause of PCOS would be insulin resistance. Now, there was a research that was conducted in 2012 on 90 adolescent girls. So there were 90 adolescent girls between the age of 15 to 18, and they were divided into two groups. One group was given a package of yoga to practice, that is asans, pranayam, and meditation, as well as surya namaskar, and the other group was given conventional exercises. Then what the researchers had done, they had uh, uh, written down the test of the blood lipid level as well as the glucose metabolism. Now, for, uh, they were made to do this particular thing like the yoga as well as the conventional exercise. They were made to do this for one hour every day for 12 weeks. And that was monitored. When they were doing it, it was monitored. Now, at the end of the 12th week, they were seen that the results showed that there was a drastic difference in both the groups. But still, it had to be calculated that what is better? Is yoga better to, uh, you know, uh, manage PCOS or is conventional exercise better for the management of PCOS? So there was a test that is called man whitney U test that was run. And the conclusion showed that yoga is far more effective in reducing the size of the cysts and improving the condition of PCOS amongst these females who are uh, basically adolescents. Now coming to the management and treatment of PCOS. As I said, that PCOS is said to have no cure. That is what modern medicine says. But before knowing about PCOS and about treatments, we have to understand what is health, because health is a very broad spectrum. The Vedic scriptures define health as associated with balance and ill health as, as associated with imbalance. So what yoga therapy does is basically, 
It restores the balance through self-corrective techniques. The word health is derived from the old English word health, which means a state of being sound. Even if we see the definition of health by the World Health Organization, it says that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Even if we see our own Shastras, that is Ayurved, what does Ayurved have to say about perfect health? The definition of perfect health according to Ayurved is Samdosha, Samaganishcha, Sata, Samdhatu Malkriya, Prasanna Matra, Mendriya Mana, Swastha Ityabhidhyate. So, health is called Swastha. Swa means sthit hona hi Swastha kehlata hai. To be established in one's own self is known as Swastha, O Health. Even in the most uh, you know, important uh, Yoga Shastra as we know, that is the Bhagavad Gita, how does it uh, define what is perfect health? According to the Bhagavad Gita, the state of perfect health is known as Samatvam. In the Gita, chapter 2, verse 46, 48, I'm sorry, Sri Krishna says that Yogastha Kuru Karmani, Sangamatvakta Dhananjay, Siddhya Siddhyo Samabhutva, Samatvam Yog Uchate. That means equanimity in every situation in every uh, circumstance is that state of samatva, o homeostasis, o balance. And that is a state equated to perfect health, also called as yoga in the Bhagavad Gita. Now, as I said that uh, I have had PCOS for almost 14 years of my life, and I managed my PCOS, and right now I have even managed to cure my PCOS. So I would share with you my personal journey of how I had cured my PCOS. But it was not only through yoga, but it was also with lifestyle modification, obviously, because it is a lifestyle disorder, and along with conventional medicine. Now, when I was uh, around 15 to 16 years of age, that was the time when I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And I had gone to the gynecologist with my mother. Now the first line of treatment that is given to any lady who has polycystic ovarian syndrome is that the gynecologist would give that lady, the PCOS patient, birth control pills or contraceptive pills. That time I was only 15 to 16 years of age. And when I started having these birth control pills, that are the first medication according to modern medicine, I experienced severe vomiting, a lot of nausea and a lot of dizziness. So what I did is, I discontinued that uh, contraceptive pills and I went to the doctor again and I told the doctor that it's causing a lot of dizziness and vomiting, so I'm sorry, I cannot have these contraceptive pills. Then the doctor gave me something uh, known as clomiphene and metformin. Now metformin is a thing that has tremendous effects on curing my facial hair. So metformin was a thing that really, really helped me in removing the problems that I had regarding the facial hair. Now, as I said that I used conventional medicine, I also used yoga therapy. I want to share with you something about me. Perhaps uh, uh, could not uh, give uh, like uh, tell about me properly. That uh, I have never been in this particular field of yoga. I have never been in this from before. I happened to come into this field few years ago due to my personal problem of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And uh, right now also, currently, I'm pursuing a PhD from Lucknow University and my specialization is yoga in the Bhagavad Gita. In my master's degree, by the blessings of God, I had the opportunity to study the original Shastras in Sanskrit, that is Ghiran Sanghita, Hatrat Navali, Shiv, uh, Shiv Sanghita, Siddha Siddhan Paddhati, and, um, uh, and even Hatha Yoga Pradipika and also Patanjali Yoga Sutra, which is called Patanjali Yoga Sutras. So when I read these Shastras in the original form in Sanskrit and even in Hindi and English, what is the thing that I, I deduced? What I could understand is that there are certain uh, asans and kriyas and pranayams that focus on improving our reproductive health. Obviously, PCOS is a modern day lifestyle disorder. This did not happen to people or this did not happen to ladies 40, 50 years ago. This is a problem that is happening right now due to our bad lifestyle. So when the Shastras was written about thousands, thousands of years ago, something known as polycystic ovarian syndrome did not even happen. But there are uh, mentions of uh, certain asans and kriyas and pranayams which can manage the problems of the reproductive functions. Now to understand this, I would like to share with you what is the concept of a disease. According to the original Yoga Shastras, a disease is said to happen in a place where there is accu accumulation or collection of toxic waste. I'll give you two examples to cite this. Number one, uh, suppose there is accumulation of cholesterol at a particular place, like in the heart, in the artery, that leads to blockages of the artery. 
The second example is in gouty arthritis. Uh, they are the uric acid crystals that deposit in the joints and that leads to swelling or inflammation. That is, is something that results in gouty arthritis. So that is the toxins that are accumulated. In the same way, we would think that what are the toxins that are in PCOS and how should we mitigate it or how should we remove it from the body? In PCOS, the toxic waste are the cysts that grow in the ovaries. And in yoga, the easiest way and the most effective way to remove these cysts or to reduce its size at least is to, pr uh, is to practice the yogic shodhan kriya. Now, amongst these various uh, uh, scriptures that I told you about yoga shastras, amongst this one shastra particularly focuses on uh, cleansing techniques, that is the yoga shodhan kriya. And that is known as Gherand Samhita, written by Maharishi Gherand. He has written, and I quote, Shat karmana shodhanan cha asanin bhavedidranam. Mudraya sthirta cheva pratyahare nirdhirta. Pranayama laghavam cha dhyanat pratyakshmatmana. Samadhina niliptam cha muktirev na sanshayaha. He has written that there are six, six very powerful techniques of cleansing the body of the toxins, be it PCOS, that means the cysts that are in the ovaries, or any other toxins that are in the body. And these are known as the six shat karmas, or the six techniques of cleansing of the body, that is dhoti, vasti, neti, noli or loliki, tratak, and kapal bhati. Now, I would like to share with you some very important information. Uh, this was my transformative journey of uh, basically PCOS and the photograph that you see is of mine. That was the time when I had acute PCOS and uh, you can see the hair on my face. Uh, that was hirsutism, it was severe hirsutism. And I went from having PCOS that was not only acute but it was chronic and right now I don't have any cyst at all. But PCOS is a condition that doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in a few weeks. It takes months or perhaps sometimes even uh, years to accumulate in the body. So as we see that these problems take so much of time to develop into a disease known as polycystic ovarian syndrome. In the same way, curing this problem or this medical condition would also take equivalent amount of time. In the Gita, there is one very nice uh, shlok, uh, 6 by 17. It says... Yukta hara viharasya, yukta chestasya karmasu, yukta swapna bodhasya, yogo bhavati dukahara. In this, Sri Krishna has mentioned the importance of modulation or the importance of samatva or regulation. That means balance in life. He says that if you make a, strike a balance between four things, that is balance in eating, balance in recreation, balance in sleeping and balance in work, if you can strike a balance in all of these four through yoga, then that is the state of yoga in which you will have absolutely no diseases. Now, all of this seems very idealistic, you know, all of these definitions of yoga that I have mentioned uh, according to the Ved Shastras, according to the Yoga Shastras, even according to the definition of health by World Health Organization, one would think that I don't think anybody uh, sitting over here would be healthy in that sense because the state of health as according to these parameters is something very idealistic. But let me tell you that what we need to consider is that the concept of health, that is perfect health and sickness, are not two distinct concepts, but they are two ends of the same spectrum. Now before that, I would like to ask you a certain question. Does anybody know which is the first book that was written in the world? The first book that was ever written in the world. You all can answer from your seats. The first book that was ever written in the world. Very true. The first book ever written in the world is a product of Bharat. It is the Rig Veda. What is the first poem ever written in the world? The first I'm sorry? Very true. <laughs> the first poem ever written in the world is the Valmiki Ramayan, again, a product of India. The first ever written prose in the world is also a product of Bharat, the Yajur Ved. The first Vyakran ever written is also from Bharat, Panani's Ashtadhyaya. The first book on arithmetic is also from Bharat, Bodhyan. The first book on sociology, Kalpa Sutra, is also from Bharat. The first book of astronomy is also a product of Bharat, Vedang Jyotish. 
as we all know zero was also an invention from bharat do you know that the uh, value the calculation of pi was also done by bharatiyas the concept of square root was not any foreign or alien concept it was originated from bharat they say that the numbers 1 to 9 are also originated from bharat some people say that those are arabic numerals do you know what do arabs call these numerals they call it hind se hindustan se hind se it would also be very fascinating to know that in the 19th century 123 shastras were converted were translated from sanskrit and other regional languages to english by the britishers now why am i telling you all of this i am telling you all of this because we don't need to just keep the shastras at home like that we need to take out the knowledge that is embedded in those shastras and try to apply it in our life obviously through the help of an enlightened guru or at least a yoga practitioner now the goal of any yoga shastra is obviously to attain moksha or nirvana or salvation but not everybody can reach that high level of uh, you know sadhana and most of us are household people we are living our daily lives so we don't even aim to attain salvation but even if we tap into 1% of the knowledge that is lied in uh, that lies in our shastras and apply it to our life maybe we can mitigate many problems that we have so that is how we can yog- use yoga and with yoga now since everybody we see that in today's times since i'm talking about particularly about pcos which is a female problem they are ladies who do completely night shifts so they work all night and they sleep all day they are also women who do very hectic 9 to 5 jobs and then they come back to their household and they have to you know do household chores so it's very easy to say that you need to practice asan pranayam mudra band meditation but it's very difficult to carry on that persistent and regular practice so in that case what we need to do we need to understand and use the therapy of yoga the wisdom of yoga as well as the conventional medicine in our life for a pcos free life because as it is said and i would like to end that if science gives us the lens it is yoga that gives us the view thank you thank you uh, mr sharma for that uh, powerful talk and for sharing your personal experience now both these uh, sessions are open for question and answers i request uh, uh, dr firdaus also to come to the stage any questions from audience sir welcome hello uh, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation um this question is for the first speaker um just speak into the mic okay can you hear me now yes yeah so this is for the first speaker um so, uh, while going through your presentation i was uh, uh really uh, it was a wonderful uh, experience to see that ha- the depth of uh, knowledge in ayurveda and uh, yoga and how you could implement it to cure uh, something like cancer so with such uh, knowledge and such um, uh, data also um the outer the external world won't accept this as a, uh, a, a credible uh, standard uh, uh, data right so uh, are we trying to force fit uh, ayurveda into the um, already set standards by the western world or uh, the modern medicine or should we develop uh, a different standard where uh, these can be measured and uh, accepted there are two things to tell one is uh, being a doctor or a vaidya that is our karma to do uh, our karmas uh, it is it should be effective for patients we need not much worried about uh, the um, appreciations that one thing the other thing is uh, i had been practicing for past 25 years now i think quite everybody has accepted in 
many areas and I am trying to teach some students also. And the other things the whole world has to do. That is the, our power of uh, our Bharata and uh, we have to find the ways. I'm telling the many excellent scholars and eminent personalities are there and I am ready to share everything. Uh, no secrets, nothing to teach. So it is, that should be the aim of such colloquium. That I have to tell. Thank you. Um, if I may, Chairman, thank you. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Uh, interestingly, I'm a GP, I'm a uh, doctor, modern medicine, uh, based in Australia. And uh, when we have been trained in the, through the evidence-based medicine, and actually, I must admit that, you know, when you put those figures that you had treated all those patients, uh, I did have a little sh sense of shudder in my, in my heart saying that, you know, how would it be seen in a, in a, in a more, from our perspective, you know, how would we see that um, as evidence to support this kind of treatment? Um, but having said that, I have to say, I, I, I'm a holistic practitioner back in Australia, where I'm a GP, I try to incorporate several modalities. And as my own uncle, who was an Ayurvedic practitioner, was the inspiration for me to become a GP. So it turns out like full circle, and during my medical years, I was actually protesting against certain things that would be surgery being introduced in Ayurvedic practice. So it has just like come back a full circle. Uh, my question is, um, do you have any, the, the collaborative, do you, have you had any collaboration with uh, oncologists or anybody while you were engaging your, your patients? Yes, I am having co collaborations. Uh, my brother is an allopathy doctor, means a physician, and uh, my brother's wife, and in our family to say, 46 doctors are there. <laughs> <laughs> so, both Ayurveda and uh, physicians. And uh, my brother running uh, one 300 bedded hospital also. So, such collaborations are there. But I am not f satisfied with these data that need some help. But I, am, I had been working with uh, as a uh, scholar in uh, OECD scientist group. They, those people have helped me much. Then the other part, again, I am telling eminent scholars are there. They have to decide. Um, thank you, both the speakers. Fantastic, power packed. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, thank you. Both the speakers were fantastic, very power packed, and very proud to see uh, such advances being made. My question is for Dr. Firdos. Uh, you're hiding behind the this thing. Okay. Um, yeah. So in your practice, you talked about making the the, the patient rich, Adya Yogi. Yeah. Uh, can you please explain a bit about that? I'm very intrigued by that concept. And also, uh, I loved how you talked about bringing intuition into your practice because that is something which sort of stands apart. I think, of course, uh, that comes into modern medicine also. Uh, but uh, even otherwise, uh, having an intuitive edge when you're treating somebody, uh, I, I think that gives an edge. Uh, you can obviously you know, know that. Uh, but yeah, uh, please, uh, about the richness of the patient. Thank you. Hello. Uh, yes. Richness of the patient in the sense, uh, he, should be, he or she should be uh, rich in good qualities that we have to teach them. What is the purpose of life, first one? The purpose of intellect, sense organs, uh, mind, body concept, what is it, and what he is. Actually, every human body, uh, human beings are a group of cells, to say one, 120 trillion cells. Among that, again, microbes are there. And this uh, trillions and trillions of cells are there. A, one thing, only shwasa uh, hold together. We are such a thing. We are um, like that. So we have to teach those patients what they are and what, I mean, uh, 
uh, what, um, what is life, uh, everything we have to teach them, to the worth of uh, social commitment. Social commitment is very important. If you go and uh, give, means, uh, what is uh, to say, Self selfishness, selfishness, that is most important. So whatever they need, they, if they want to live for others, that is important. And uh, they should be, and they should have memories, good memories will be there. They'll forget about everything, what they are having. I used to ask my patients uh, first, do you, uh, when they're in a state of sadness, uh, do you have clothes to live the whole life? Yes, in all of, most of the patient, in their cupboard, there will be clothes enough to uh, do uh, till the end of their life. They have um, this one, uh, shelter and food also. So they, uh, the, the next aspect is the luxury of those things that is remaining. In this sense, we can tell many, many things to them and that way we can bring them, uh, make them idea. And uh, the in, uh, about the intuition, uh, we, uh, I, the same thing uh, is applicable to see, to us. We should be, first we should be kind. kind. Four qualities I think um, important for doctors are one is excellence, excellence in their science. They should be excellent. And the other thing is uh, they should be kind. Mercy, that is the word should use. And uh, very compassionate. And the other thing is practical experience. And last thing is communication. Communication also is important. If you could communicate properly, then only we can teach them what, what they need. I'll take much time for that. Every day, uh, till the 24 hours I am working, my phone never off. I uh, keep on, I means while going for rounds, three hospitals I'm running, or keep on uh, giving this, uh, count, not, I can't tell it counseling. It gives some sort of awareness. That is important, no time, that's. Uh, thank you Hello. for, I have a question actually. Can I start? I have a mic here. Uh, I think the oh, yeah. one who has started the question can complete that. Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. It's very inspiring. Uh, I hope uh, 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 Ms. Rachel's uh, uh, you know, research and work gets uh, published and there's uh, you know, benefit to everybody. And um, I was just wondering, uh, you know, yoga, what we are trying to achieve now, didn't we have a similar challenge with Ayurveda before? I mean, it's to get it accepted. Uh, so do you find that Ayurveda has now been accepted, um, you know, by the international community? Uh, challenge is still there, but our excellence is important. Uh, there is no difference between allopathy, Ayurveda, no sim systems. Because if we show our power, what we have done with data, everybody will accept us. Okay. No issues in that. Actually, I got more support from modern doctors than the Ayurveda doctors because the depth of this Ayurvedic science is in the Vedas. Yes. Without learning Veda, and I am a Sufi concept also, without learning those things, we could not understand what we are learning. That is the thing. In that sense, science is better. Science is outside. That is, that is also very deep. We have to use all sorry tools. to interrupt. interrupt. Uh, time is uh, limiting factor, so I think thank you both uh, speakers. The rest of the questions can be asked personally uh, during the break time. Shall we move on to the, I think due to lack of time, we have to move on. Thank you both speakers. Thank you very much. So uh, we now break for tea. Uh, it's uh, 4, 5, so 10 minutes tea break, 4.15. We hope to have all of you back. So we have one session followed by the session together with um, Sri Amjit.